In the year 1836, Ethiopia finds itself fractured. Once a united empire is now just feudal lords squabbling for power. This period of history would be called the Age of Princes. And today, I am going not only to end it, but unite the whole of East Africa and grow our GDP into the millions. Hello and welcome, my name is DWK, and let me tell you the story of how I got there. I began the game as Shiwa, a Ethiopian state located in the middle of modern-day Ethiopia. To our west lay fractured Ethiopian Christian states, while to the east Islamic ones. The beginning of the game will be quite hectic, with all the states declaring war on each other. I began the game by starting a diplomatic play to conquer Sidamo. Luckily for me, they backed down and Amara grew even more united. I decided to keep my momentum and keep going south. Kafa was next on the table since they could get quite powerful later on. This time they were not only not backing down, but also brought Borana with them. This was perfect for me. In one war we could unite the rest of Amara. While the army was busy preparing for war, a certain outlaw prince rapidly rose to power and was now on his way to claim the throne of Shiwa. The current prince, Sal Salisi, tried to object, but all attempts to apprehend the outlaw failed, and the army wouldn't mind an actually competent commander to lead them in a war against a larger army. With that, Theodos became the prince and commander of the Shia army. Let me tell you, he's pretty good. While the newly hired general Pelel held the Kaffa front, Theodros quickly overran Borana. After this, Kaffa was outnumbered and quickly folded to the rule of the true prince of Ethiopia. But while Theodros was busy uniting Amara, the Islamic state of Hara was doing the same. Now Ethiopia laid split right in the middle. Theodros declared the creation of the Ethiopian Empire and himself as its emperor. This meant the beginning of the war on Hara to unite the ancient empire. To save the war was hard is to lie to you. The now experienced army of the outlaw prince quickly pushed into the desert, after which the army closed in on the capital of Gondor. With the war over, the Age of Princes has ended. Ethiopia, disunited for the last 100 years, was now back together. But this was only the beginning. The nation was now united, but that did not mean the end of the struggle to keep it together. Many people were lucky to live in poverty, while others weren't so lucky and were starving. If Tuadros wanted the country to outlast his reign, he needed to make sure the country relied on itself and kept the people fed and happy. To achieve this, the capital was moved to Gondor, the rightful seat of the empire. The main issue laid in the lack of infrastructure in the empire. Of course, there wasn't much that could be done with the state of Oromia, which was almost entirely comprised of desert. But the rest of the country could be improved. The emperor declared road maintenance to be done all over the country to make sure that goods actually arrive where they were needed. Next was the process of setting up tool construction to improve the production in the fields. With the basic needs fulfilled for now, now the problem of taxation needed to be tackled. The Age of Princes left almost all government administrations abandoned, and as of now, the country was losing half of its tax. Historically, Tuadros wasn't just a conqueror, but he also advocated for many reforms within the country and church. Paper mills for government buildings were constructed in the capital, while the armed forces were invited to join the government. Now with increased funds, the country could begin constructing manufactories all over the country to improve the lives of its people. This also brought change to the political landscape, creating a new interest group of industrialists in the country. In the year of 1851, the University of Gondor opened its doors. The emperor knew what power the industrial revolution could bring to his country, though as of now Ethiopia lacked the crucial resource of coal to achieve that. As one of his last decrees, the now old emperor began talks of expanding the empire in the core of the continent, via colonization. He would not see the decree come to fruition in his life as he died in the year 1853, and was succeeded by Haley Malakot, son of the deposed prince of Shiwa, as Theodros failed to produce an heir during his reign. Though, historically, he did have a son named Alamanyu, but in real life, Theodros' reign was a bit more bloody, and his son never succeeded him, and Haley was 
actually the one deposed by Tedros during his rise to power. Nevertheless, the new emperor was now eager to not only expand his empire through colonization, but also through conquest of the Horn of Africa. The Somali sultans had no chance against the united Ethiopia, and quickly fell one by one. By now, the law for colonial resettlement had passed, and the country made its way to Rift Valley to exploit the coal found there. But Ethiopia wasn't the only nation with ambition for Africa. The British had landed on the coast of Kenya and now were colonizing the essential state of the future of Ethiopia. At a much quicker rate due to the presence of malaria there and the lack of technology Ethiopia had. Which I have to say paradox. It is a bit stupid for a country entirely comprised of states with malaria in them. We needed to act now before the British had a stronger foothold here. Though our army's technology was a bit behind, we could exploit the lack of British forces in the colony. A swift diplomatic play to kick the British out was started and we moved in on the clueless Brits. Which is not how it went for Ethiopia IRL. In any case, for some reason they didn't try to naively invade us. So slowly war score ticked up and the land was ours. With that, the coal was now secure. But now, our country remained isolationist and the absolute empire. But with the rise of the industrialists, we had the opportunity to open up to the world and start including more interest groups in our government. In the year 1856, the country became a constitutional monarchy and got this snazzy flag. We also had a proper economy and construction sector to fuel the industrial revolution. And so, the construction of coal mines in Rift Valley began. The industrialists in charge were finally able to get rid of slavery and serfdom. The next 10 years was steady growth for our industry and GDP. We at last were able to make our own rifles and cannons, putting our army on par with ones in Europe. In the year 1866, I at last was able to research quinine, which rapidly advanced our colonization speed. Speaking of, is it really colonization if all cultures you incorporate are already accepted? Well, they were all full citizens of the empire. But while I was busy with Ethiopia, I haven't really paid much attention to Europe. Let's see what's going on. Never mind, I have no clue how AI accomplished this this early. But going back to Ethiopia, the desert state of Oromia at last had infrastructure. Great beasts of steel and fire, as we were called by the local tribes, cruised at never-before-seen speeds across the desert. From here, the country was quite stable and profitable, and the GDP began to skyrocket. While most of the coast was secured, only Portugal remained, and had decided to go further inland. Before, we couldn't do much against them. But now, the country was more industrial than some European nations, and I had access to repeating rifles. To end this campaign, I moved to secure the Portuguese colonies in one great final war. We swiftly moved across the land, and swiftly won the war. Of course, if I wanted, I could continue and slowly take the rest of the colony, without getting too much infamy. But I think you get the idea of how this campaign went. In any case, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to subscribe since this channel is new. See ya!